We got orders to uh, move out in positions out in front. There was a graveyard out there. And uh, so we moved down in our positions and and I took the right flank and we set up right out there and we were right out at the rice paddies there, right up, right beside the road there. My squad was on that side and I could look up and see the road. I laid back on one of them dikes there and went to sleep for a while until a guy woke me up and, and said they'd call me to the CP group. And that's when Captain Brennan gave us orders to, uh, you know, we were going to move out. Had two platoons on line in front and the CP group and two platoons on line in the back, I reckon the way it was. And, and, of course, my squad was still on the right flank, but we were in closer together than we were before. We were spread out quite a bit, and we moved in together. Another company or something was taking casualties and, and taking pretty heavy fire somewhere uh, east or west of where we were at. And we were going to go and move in support of them. I, unbeknownst to me at the time when I was asleep in the rice paddy there, uh, when the guy woke me, I can't remember who it was, woke me up, but he told me to be careful because we'd been getting sniper rounds all around over there. And I said, okay. So when I went back, went back to the CP group, Captain Brent said, we've got to change the plans. We're going to go into the village. We're going to line up two platoons, CP group, two platoons. And uh, so I was kind of reluctant to want to do that, but... Uh, since we'd been getting sniper rounds. But anyway, so we were going to proceed to do that. I went back, and then when we got the word to, to move out, we got up. And all I can remember is the first thing I saw uh, when we got to move out, machine gun opened up, and I seen the CP group fall, some of them, in, in the, but everybody hit the ground. And in the meantime, then I got shot in the leg, and at that time, everything had progressed pretty strong, you know. We couldn't tell that much going on being down. We couldn't really tell that much going on up there. But I seen a lot of them coming out of that village and stuff, and, I, and they weren't. We were far on the right flank, and they really wasn't coming to us so much right then. So then, after I got hit, I think it was uh, Allen Allen and Baines, I can't remember a couple of guys was helping me. We got orders to fall back, and they were helping me back. And uh, we could go so far, and then, uh, and then we just had to get down and then get up and start again because we were pretty far out. And we got back and moved back into that graveyard and took up positions behind the, the grave mounds and the headstones and all that. And I was told to take my positions up on the left flank. And so I took up positions on the left flank. I seen people getting on bicycles and coming around. I think Alan or somebody hollered at me, and, and I was looking at them, and I said, you know, I just told them, you know, shoot. I was on the radio, and I was listening to a lot of this communication going on. The jets from the base up at Da Nang, they were f taking off, and... They would reach altitude, and you could see them jets looking back. You could see them jets getting altitude and going up. But they weren't coming our direction. There was nothing coming our direction. There were no gunships, no nothing. And I couldn't understand that. So finally they got a, a couple of gunships came in, uh, and uh, there was a gunship that was headed right toward where my squad was, and he opened fire with a burst, and I got on the radio and I told him to cease fire, cease fire. And I told him I'd throw some, I threw some smoke out. So he identified the smoke. And I said, turn around and go the other way. So he made a turn and, and went back toward the village, you know, and, and started open fire over there. And I couldn't see a whole lot going on from my direction, but I knew there was a lot of them coming. Uh, you know, the guys up in front were really catching it bad, you know. Of course, a lot of guys got killed up there. So I was mostly in communication uh, with uh, Wendover, and and uh, and I could hear Brennan and Wendover and them talking and stuff, you know, and and what was going on, and uh, then 
a lot of firing, you know, I mean, it was just, I, I just knew to myself we were all going to die. I mean, it was just, it was just at that point, I just knew, I said, man, I said, you know, we're all going to die. Because it was just intense, and we, you know, we weren't, uh, there wasn't, you know, at the time, like I said, there wasn't any support coming in until, you know, later. And uh, so I do remember, I remember I just I just told God, I said, God, I said, if you'll get me out of this, I said, I'll do anything you want me to do. And I made that promise. So we did make it. A lot of us didn't make it. A lot of us did. And uh, I remember... Uh, there was a Marine, I think a Marine helicopter. We were running out of ammunition. And I, we had set our backpacks off over in one area back there. And I had all the magazines over there. And I got somebody to go get those magazines, you know, so we could have some more ammunition. And I do remember a Marine helicopter coming in. And this guy come in, I mean, and when the... Heat was going and landed and, and brought us some more ammunition in. And I remember somebody, of course, I don't remember who, uh, had an AK-47, if I remember, went up and gave it to that pilot on that chopper. I remember seeing that. And I said, well, no, that's kind of weird, but I guess the guy, you know, he just gave him an AK-47, you know, because, hey, but. Uh, and uh, I got some ammunition and went back. And uh, then after that, well, uh, some of the guys, you know, they had, they'd quit firing some, you know, and, and some of the guys were trying to get back, and they, a lot of the guys were crawling back. And it was getting close to dusk, uh, you know, at the time. And and uh, they were, the helicopters, when finally the medevacs finally could get to come in a little bit, they were taking the guys that were hurt really bad, you know, out. And uh, I wasn't going to go, and the doc told me to get on the chopper. They, I think they brought in a Chinook at the last right there, uh, the one that I got on. He told me to go on and get on the chopper. So, And I went and got on the chopper, and I don't remember everybody that was on there, but I do remember the guy that had his, got shot through the eye. And uh, I was holding him some, and, and he was bleeding pretty good and and uh, he was telling me that he could see the the VC and I reckon there was VC and NVA too and he said he could see them coming and, and he was firing I think he told me his gun jammed I'm not sure but and he felt that bullet hit him and he was unconscious some and then but he remembered when he was semi-conscious that they were rolling him over and was taking his web gear off of him and he said he just didn't move you know he just let him move or whatever and then he just started crawling he said he don't know how he said it must have been the lord uh, was guiding me in the right direction he said because he had no way of knowing which way he was crawling but he actually crawled crawled back and made it back to the line Uh, we got to the Marine Aid Station, and man, it was plum chaos there. And and uh, they throwed me on this table thing, you know. And I had blood up here, and they was pulling my shirt off. And I said, "Man, I said my leg." And, uh, and so, so I heard one of the guys say, uh, "Tag him to the ship," and. <laughs> kind of weird though they put a tag on my toe you know and, and a little while later they came around and and put me on them one of them gurney things and the helicopter landed and they put us on the helicopter and flew us out to the ship and i believe it was uh, uh uss sanctuary was the name of the hospital ship and i don't remember much about getting off the chopper did i, I do remember laying on the uh the deck outside and uh, I could hear the choppers 
coming in and leaving. I, I laid out there for it seemed like quite a while, that, but anyway, then they uh, carried me into uh, a bay there in a little examining room, and the doctor said, you know, that uh, the uh, operating rooms were full and that he was going to have to work on me there, you know, and do the best he could and all that. So I was doped up, and I didn't remember a whole lot of happening going on, but I do remember going back into that room, and the doctor would take and take my bandage, and he would take and uh, I guess he was pouring peroxide in there where they had it cut open. So, man, it it would burn, uh, and uh, it was pretty painful, and I done that. When I got off the plane, they uh, had these tarps and stuff on the, on the fence right there where we were getting off the plane and going into the hospital there at the entrance. I could hear people hollering stuff and everything, you know. And I asked one of the guys that's put, you know, pulling my gurney thing, I said, what the crap's going on back there? He said, well, they got a bunch of protesters outside the fence. And that's them out there, you know. I guess it's anti-war protesters or whatever. But you couldn't see them because they had them tarps on the fence. So they couldn't see in, but they knew people was coming in. But, and you know, I when I when they was wheeling me in there, and I was feeling sorry for them. I mean, I was pretty down. I was feeling sorry for myself, and I was feeling guilty because I got out. They wheeled me into, the, into that corridor, and right in front of me was a guy in a bed. He was wrapped all the way from his head to here. And his legs from his knees down were gone. And they had his stumps here in baskets so he couldn't move them. And they wheeled me past that guy. And I quit feeling sorry for myself. So they let us they let us call home. So they had them old telephone booths, you know, like you used to have, you know, them little booths in the train stays and stuff. And and uh, so they had it set up to where you could just go in and, and dial your number at home, you know. And, and of course, I called my mother. Because at the time, I, my wife was living with her mother and them at the time, and I couldn't remember their number. So I called my mother. I knew I knew my number. And I called my mother, and I told her, you know, where I was at. And uh, uh, so I knew right off from talking to her, she didn't know that I'd been wounded and he evac out because she hadn't been notified or nothing. Neither had my wife, really. And uh, so I told her, I said, now, Mom, I said, uh, I said, I'm up here in the hospital, but I said, I'm okay. Of course, she started crying. I said, hey, look, I said, I'm okay. And uh, so after the phone call, then I stayed there maybe two or three days, and then they sent me back to the hospital at Fort Campbell. Uh, transfer uh, headquarters barracks, they had... Uh, uh, warrant officers and 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 different NCOs and people that were coming through, uh, going to other assignments and stuff, and they stayed in that that building, that barracks, you know, till they transferred out. And then uh, it's kind of a transition place for them to stay. And uh, so I was in charge of that barracks and all that and. And I was in charge of the officers and NCOs duty roster on post. So I had a pretty good cushy job my last five months in the service. And uh, so I held on to that job, you know, till I was discharged. And of course, they tried to get me to re-up and everything, you know, and I, I wouldn't do that. Major Putnam tried to get me to go to OCS and all this, you know. We got pretty tight because uh, when I took that job, you know, uh, when you come back from from Nam, according to that there, they give you 30 days leave. <clears throat> and uh, 
he told me, he said, look, he said, uh, if you'll take and and uh, get all this stuff done, uh, well, I told him I wanted to take all my leave at one time. He said, well, I'd rather you not do that until a certain date. I don't remember what that was. But he said, if you'll wait and get all this done, that's got to be done till then, he said, I'll let you take your whole 30 days at a time. And uh, so I said, well, okay, that's a deal. So I didn't take no... Uh, I didn't go home on no weekends there for a while and everything, you know, and, and had to do stuff. And and uh, so when I told that old sergeant I was taking his place before he retired, I was taking 30 days leave. Oh, no, so you ain't taking no 30 days. Ain't nobody gets 30 days leave one time around this place. I'll, tell, I'll see to that. And uh, it didn't take him about two or three minutes in there at the major, you know, when he came back. And he said, well, I guess you get 30 days. <laughs> So, uh, so I had it made pretty good after after I got out from Vietnam. Yeah, uh, the company that I worked for, they uh, was good about keeping jobs for vets at the time. You know, so whenever you whenever you left, uh, uh, you come back, you could go back back to the job, and so I was lucky at that point. Uh, being able to go back and and have a job, a lot of guys didn't have that opportunity, you know, because when they were gone, they were gone, and and so I was pretty pretty fortunate to have that happen. And I didn't join the VVA for a while because I stayed back, you know, and I didn't. I didn't get involved with anybody till one of the guys that, that was a friend of mine talked me into joining the uh, VVA, and uh, I served vice president of the chapter for one year, and uh, then I was on the board directors for about three years, three different times, and uh, so that's pretty much my involvement with the Vietnam veterans and then of course we done we done all kinds of stuff you know we did uh, um, they got what they call you know I don't know if you've ever seen the hat ceremony that they do where they have the table set up and they have the five branches of service but it's a real real moving thing and I've never seen anybody do the hat ceremony thing like our our guys in our chapter did it uh, we performed it at an uh, uh, air show for people at one time. I didn't do it because I wasn't in it. But uh, but presently, I uh, serve on the, uh, the honor guard. We have an honor guard, and we do the military funerals at the National Cemetery up in Chattanooga. And, I mean, it's it's amazing that amount of, vets that they bury every day. I've done as many as six funerals in one day and a lot of times three, four, six. Uh, and I don't do them every day, but I know in 2007 that the Honor Guard done over 200 funerals at National Cemetery and not just National Cemetery, but in outlining areas in different cemeteries uh, and we don't we don't charge nothing, and we do a full military funeral. Uh, we do uh, the guys, uh, even uh, a lot of them. They they do the pallbearers, uh, and they uh, they fold the flag, and do the 21 gun salute and taps. We do a full military funeral, didn't regardless of name, rank, or whatever. We give them all the same. We don't do pallbearers on all of them, but only when they're requested. Like, and uh, there's some of the guys that that do them every day. That we have one, and I don't do them every day because I have a lot of other stuff that I'm involved in that I do. But I do quite a bit. I think I've done already about 50 or 60 this year. That's all I've done. But that's mostly my involvement as far as uh, veterans groups goes today. The guys 
basically the guys in my squad in the platoon, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you just get attached to guys. and it, That's one thing. And it's any any war you go in, I mean, you, you spend time with these guys and and uh, anybody gets hurt or anything, you know, it, it, it gets you hard. I mean, it, it tears your heart out a lot. Well, Van Horn and, and Captain Brennan and Lieutenant Wendover. Now, Wendy, uh, I'll tell you what. Now, that he he seemed to me to be a smart young man and very knowledgeable. And uh, I think all the guys really respected Wendover and Brennan and, and Wendover, you know, uh, a whole lot. I know I did. And... So yeah, I, the leadership to me was superb. Van Horn was was tough. I mean, he he's he was a big-hearted guy, but see, he I think that Van Horn uh, he took his he took his position really serious, and uh, he really wanted he wanted the guys to listen to him because being already done a tour in Vietnam, and I think he had gotten wounded along with Captain Brennan when they served in Vietnam before. And he knew what it was like. And I guess uh, until you really know what being in combat is like, you, you just can't imagine it. I mean, it's, it's something different, I mean, you know. And you don't know how you're going to react until it happens. And I think Van Horn wanted everybody to learn from his experience that what you had to do to survive in Vietnam. And he took it serious, and he wanted... He wanted everybody to take it serious. Alan Allen, <laughs> Alan Allen's a whole different story. That guy, I tell you what, I mean, he being from Texas and all, and, and when I first met Alan Allen, I said, "Now, how's a guy named Alan Allen?" And I was thinking at the time I was from Allentown, Texas, and I said, "How any world can that be?" Well, so Alan Allen from Allentown, Texas. Now, Alan and I had a little uh, good relationship. Of course, I, I had a pretty good relationship with most of the guys in my squad. Uh, and I got tickled at Alan because he was skinny uh, at the point, tall and skinny. But that guy would eat anything and everything. And when we was in Nam, he carried him around a canvas bag and... And what the guys didn't want out of the sea rice and stuff, Alan Allen would scarf them up. He carried that. He eat all the time, but the guy never did gain any weight, I don't reckon. But, uh, and tough too, you know. I, uh, he walked point a lot of times. And, and I hated to put Alan on point a lot, but, but Alan was sharp and he was very observant on point, you know. And you got to have a guy up front that you can trust, uh, you know, that, doesn't lead you into something. Of course, you know, him being inexperienced too, but uh, he just seemed like he, he took the job serious and he, he was very observant and I always trusted Alan to be up front. That was one thing you could count on him because, you know, whatever you want him to do or anything, Alan Allen was right there and no questions. Bitch a little bit sometimes, but always go and and do do what he's supposed to do. And over the years, uh, uh, been at reunions and and talking to Alan on the phone. We've kept in touch and everything, you know. And and of course, when after uh, Lo Jang, I think you know, as as Alan got hurt pretty bad, and that kind of broke my heart. And most of you know, I mean, it, it was the other guys too. But when you're close to and Gary Stating got killed and. And that, when I found out that, you know, after all that at Lo Zhang and after Lo Zhang, Alan would write me and tell me about, keep me informed pretty much on stuff that, you know, went on after that. And uh, so, yeah, it, it took a toll on me. 